Hi, good morning everyone. We are here to do some kids crafts today. And I'll give everyone a couple minutes to tune in, but we can start by looking behind me here at some beautiful flowers that we have blooming in our garden, some wild flowers. And already having technical difficulties. Um, so behind me, we have all different kinds of flowers and we have these wine cup mallow and we have some Queen Anne's lace. We have some Coreopsis, some black eyed Susan. And hopefully those are attracting some pollinators. And when I come out here and check on them, they often do have flies and bees, and sometimes some butterflies and some moths. And so what we're going to be creating today are butterflies, or you can do a moth if you like. Butterflies and moths are closely related. And I feel like sometimes moths are underrated. They don't get as much attention as the butterflies because they're not as showy. But there are some moths that are really, really beautiful, like the Luna moth. And we have those here at my park. So what we're going to make today is a butterfly or a moth with a coffee filter or I think you could use a paper napkin or some tissue paper so whatever you have at home we can use to make these and we'll be doing these activities on Saturday mornings at 10 o'clock and we might have some special guests who read stories we might go on a walk we might make crafts it will be different every week and focus on different native species or phenomena or ecosystems and hopefully they're engaging and informative. They're targeted towards kids, kids of all ages, and things you have at home. So I will give you the supply list ahead of time so that you can have things prepared. But a lot of times these things will be like toilet paper tubes, paint, items that you'll already have at home that you can get out and have set up for these live programs. And you can watch it later. You might be watching it later right now. But the idea is if we do it live, you can kind of do it with me. And if you have any questions, you can type them in and ask as we go. So I can answer your questions because sometimes I forget things that I already know that maybe you don't know. And so I don't say them specifically. But today, like I said, we'll be making this and some items you'll need a spray bottle, probably a plate of water would work too. And then your coffee filter, like I said, uh, if you have the triangle kind, you can cut it in half or maybe use two of them. And then pipe cleaners or a clothespin. Uh, if you don't have one of these handy, you can be creative and find something around your house that you could maybe paint or use your markers on and make that the abdomen and thorax of the insect that we're creating. And then some washable markers and it is important that they're washable because of the water we want them to spread and then next week we will be making this frog and so i'll put the supply list out but just to give you an idea of what we'll be making next week it'll be this guy so we chose to start with pollinators because as you can see Flowers are blooming and it's really a time of year. The pollinators are huge here in Oklahoma. And next week is pollinator week. And a lot of different organizations will be giving out some great information about pollinators. So we thought we would kick things off. And you never know what will happen behind me here in the park. We have a lot of deer that are right in this area. I heard huffing and moving around this morning. Uh, but we will proceed with our butterfly. So like I said, butterflies are an insect. I think it's always important and interesting to talk about the taxonomy or the grouping of the animals that we talk about because that gives us clues into different characteristics of that animal. So for instance, butterflies and moths are insects. And sometimes we use the word animal and we only think of mammals or maybe mammals and reptiles. And we don't think about insects being animals too, but insects are animals, right? They're alive. They have all of um, 
the characteristics that we need for an animal. And the thing about insects that we think of most is having six legs. So think about butterflies and moths and they have six legs. And so today ours won't have legs unless you wanna add some pipe cleaners and make it have six legs, we can do that. So you're going to start with your coffee filter or your tissue paper, or your napkin. And we are going to be using our markers to draw on it. And so you could pick out whatever colors you want. And when you think about butterflies, you probably think about really bright colors. So you could use a bright color so you can start coloring as I talk here. I'm going to start with this pretty orange color. This kind of reminds me of a monarch, which is the butterfly that a lot of us might think of. And the thing with insects and a lot of animals really, and, and definitely our butterflies and moths, are symmetry. So that means the left and the right are the same. If I hold this up and this has a spot right here, It's also going to have a spot on the other side. And you don't have to do this if you don't want to, uh, but we will talk some about symmetry. And so, like I said, monarchs are this bright orange color and animals are certain colors for a reason. So monarchs are this bright orange color because they taste bad. And that is a protection for them so that other bigger animals don't eat them but also by being this orange color, they're giving those other animals a warning. They're saying, don't mess with us. We taste disgusting and we're poisonous. So they don't harm us humans, uh, but they do harm animals that might try to eat them. So by giving this orange color off, they're warning those other animals to not eat them. And that's a protection for the monarch, which they don't have a lot of defenses, right? I mean, they could fly away, but they don't have big fangs or, venom or anything else to protect them against a predator. So a lot of times they themselves turn out to be prey. I'm going to use some purple next and some butterflies and moths are really camouflaged. So you might have seen some that look crazy similar to leaves. When their wings are folded up they look just like a leaf. And so that is a form of camouflage so that their predators don't see them. They don't realize that they're perhaps a tasty insect. They think that they're just part of the tree. They're maybe a leaf or look like bark. And these butterflies and moths could be really flashy colors to blend in with the flowers that they're around. And a lot of them have an iridescence. And so that's like that shiny when the light hits it and it kind of changes colors. So you can see I'm not coloring perfect or in the lines because when we spray with our water, all of the colors are going to blend together, kind of like tie dye. So I'm picking a variety of colors here. And a lot of times butterflies are really bright colors. And then you might think of moths as being drab colors or kind of like browns, kind of plain colors. And one reason for that is because butterflies are normally diurnal. So that means they're active during the daytime, like us. And moths are oftentimes nocturnal, which means active at night, like owls. And that's why you see moths around your lights at night on your front porch. And then you probably see butterflies during the day, like out in your garden. And some flowers only bloom during the daytime for butterflies. And then there are other flowers that only bloom at nighttime for moths because butterflies and moths are pollinators. They are insects that go and eat nectar and other things from plants. And then they get covered in pollen and then they spread that pollen to other plants that they go and visit because they're not just eating from one flower. They eat a little bit from one flower and then they move on to another flower and they take that pollen with them. And what they eat with, it's kind of like a tongue. It's called a proboscis. And you, if you get really close and you're really still, you can watch the proboscis come out and it unfurls and it goes down into the plant where that sweet nectar is. So this is what mine looks like. And as I said, I made it symmetrical. It's not exact, but if I folded it, those would pretty much match up with the colors on either side. 
And once I spray it, those will probably be gone. But I'm a scientist and I have to do things kind of exact in how they are in the real world because that's how my brain works. But maybe your brain is completely different and that's okay. So I'm gonna take my spray bottle and just spray it maybe 10 times. And lay it down. And then I am going to pick out my pipe cleaner. So butterflies have a head, thorax, and abdomen. Those are the body parts of a lot of insects. And butterflies are kind of plain, their, abdomen, their head, thorax, and abdomen, that center part. But moths are a lot of times really like almost feathery. They're like fuzzy. And so are their antenna. So butterflies have kind of plain antenna and these moths have these crazy big feathery antenna that are so crazy looking. They look like they're a cartoon. I just keep thinking about the Luna moth. So the Luna moth is big and green and has these long feathered antenna on them. A lot of times moths are smaller than butterflies. Butterflies are bigger. Um, and then, like I said, the moths are more drab, plain colors and the butterflies are brighter. Also, we typically use the word um, chrysalis when we talk about a butterfly that the caterpillar winds itself up and goes through a metamorphosis when it then becomes a butterfly. And then we use the word cocoon when we talk about a moth and what food that caterpillar ate while it was a caterpillar affects what color the chrysalis or the cocoon are because it's eating plants that are a certain distinct color. So a lot of times we think of like green or brown when we think of a chrysalis or a cocoon. Uh, then I said the nocturnal versus diurnal. So diurnal is a word we don't hear nearly as much, but a lot of animals are diurnal like us. Um, and then nocturnal moths. And so I think with the colors I picked, I think I'm gonna do purple for my center of my butterfly, just like I did on this one. And what I'm going to do is, you can see my tie-dye here, and I'm gonna scrunch it up in the middle and use my pipe cleaner. And what I'm gonna do today, I think I'll do the three parts like I talked about. So I'm gonna make the abdomen, and then I'm gonna make the thorax wrap around like this. And then I'm gonna make the head. So you can see here, I have the little head part. And then I'm gonna make these antenna. And so maybe later I'll cut up some other little pipe cleaners and make legs so that it has three sets of legs. So three sets of two legs, which makes six total. But I might just keep it like this. It doesn't have to be exactly correct, right? They are really pretty, but we want to learn about them and be correct in what we're learning, uh, but still make them pretty. So here is my butterfly. And then I thought we could walk around our pollinator patch. So like I said, we have these really pretty ones behind us, but here at the nature center, <clears throat> we also have about a one acre pollinator patch, which one acre is about the size of a football field. And we have this pollinator patch that are native flowers that we want to plant to attract pollinators or usually insects, but it doesn't have to be insects, that come and move that pollen from one plant to another. And we <clears throat> think about our butterflies and our moths and our bumblebees being pollinators, but other pollinators are sometimes underrated. And what I mean by that is things like beetles and flies that we might not think of as being like as pretty and glamorous are also pollinators. Uh, even spiders are pollinators, and so we want to think about all of those animals and how they contribute 
there's a fly right there. How they contribute to pollination too, not just the really pretty ones. So a lot of times it's good to leave those in the wild because they're doing work too. So here's our pollinator patch that I talked about. And we'll go in here and see what flowers are blooming. And what's cool about this is different flowers bloom at different times. So the whole thing isn't all flowers right now, um, but they'll flower different species throughout our summer. And this is milkweed or uh, butterfly weed. Oh, we got a pollinator on there. That looks like a beetle. And then we have these purple are bee balm. And they're really funny looking flowers. Some different coreopsis. So this is the bee balm and it has all different kinds of petals and um, petioles. So as you can see, we just mow a little windy path for you to walk around in here. And the animals don't always read the signs. So sometimes there are things in here that aren't pollinators, like fawn, which are young deer. And so we'll have fawn bedded down in here, which means that the mom deer, the doe, left her fawn while she went out to eat because the fawn doesn't move very fast or very, very well when it's young. So the mom has to leave it behind so she can go and feed and then come back and nurse that fawn. So sometimes you might see fawn and you might think they're abandoned, but really they're just hiding out and their mom's probably close by. She could leave them there all day. Kind of like you might go to daycare or school while your mom goes to work. That's what happens to these. And so it's best to just leave them alone unless you can see that they're visibly injured. So it's kind of overcast and it's raining on me. So some of these plants have even closed up to protect their pollen from the rain. They're triggered by the sun. So if the sun's not out, they don't open up. Here's a really pretty patch that we have. We have some black eyed Susan and some different versions of the Coreopsis. Oh, I scared off a pollinator. Isn't that pretty? And here's some more of the bee balm. This is something that I really like because it's so funky looking. It looks like maybe Dr. Seuss drew that in one of his books. And then these are some new ones that I still need to look up. This, I think it's like a Plains Coreopsis and it's a different color than the rest of them. It's kind of inverted, it's opposite of them. We had some pink milkweed, some green milkweed, but the orange is still going really strong. And this is a good ending patch of our pollinators with a lot of the purple bee balm. So this is a little walk just right outside our nature center if you come by to visit. Uh, you could take as long or as short as you wanted. Maybe you could make a list of the different plants that you see blooming and the different pollinators that you see. Take some pictures and look them up later and learn more about them. And if you made a butterfly or a moth with us today, uh, post a picture in the comments for me. One thing I didn't talk about, maybe after you spray it and it dries and it's this pretty kind of watercolor tie-dye looking, maybe you could add some eyes so not eyeballs on the, on the head, but fake eyes. If you've ever seen a butterfly in the wild that has those big round spots, those are another form of um, getting away from predators. So by having these fake big eyes, it makes it look a lot bigger than it is and predators might not go after it. So maybe after mine dries, I'll get a black marker and add some pseudo or fake eyes on the wings so that it looks like a big organism that I might not want to eat as a predator. Thanks for tuning in. And like I said, next week we'll be making this frog toy 
So I'll post on our event page. You all can have everything ready and follow along with us. I hope you all have a great pollinator week.